so two two things things on defects or what's the effect of sort of messing up uh, messing up um, the case based data on the image so we'll talk about the uh, these are like standard things you would talk about in the in sort of an engineering MRI class. So the Fourier phase shift theorem, it's usually just called the Fourier shift theorem, uh, but it's really the, the Fourier phase shift theorem. And then <coughs> very closely related, uh, the F Fourier frequency shift theorem. And uh, so this, I kind of already talked about this phase shift when we talked about the original de descriptions of case space, like if you mess with the Fourier Fourier phase, what does that do? It causes a it causes a shift in the image. This other one, Fourier frequency shift theorem, is a little a little more counterintuitive, but we'll uh, we'll go over those first, and then graduate up to what is the effect of a local B zero defect. So it turns out it has to do with the second one, <laughs> and it, it it's. It's something that's caused by the fact that the the data was collected over time. So it's an interaction with um, be between a B zero defect and the fact that you're collecting the data over time. Um, so uh, so that's that <coughs> that's the plan. So so we'll start off with the the Fourier shift theorem, but it's, it's the Fourier phase shift theorem. And this is this is a very simple simple thing which like I said you know, we, we've kind of already gone over in multiple times but it never hurts to go over things about like six times in a row at least if you're like me because the mind is the mind is recalcitrant and it uh, it attempts to sort of it's hard to change the way it thinks <laughs> um, which is a good thing because you don't want your mind to sort of be like jello you know and somebody says something and boom it changes your mind you know you gotta sort of strike back <laughs> That's why it's hard to sort of learn new things. Okay, so here's the Fourier shift theorem. And so uh, if we write out our inverse Fourier transform, so this is inverse Fourier transform because we're, we're taking case-based data on the right and we're generating an image out of it. So this is the inverse Fourier transform. So. So what the Fourier shift theorem says is a constant spatial offset. So this is this guy's a constant. I'm just do it. I'll just write it out for 1D Fourier transform, but you can expand to 2D easily. So that's a constant uh, spatial shift. And then this this is this guy's the variable. So that's the variable that extends across. Uh, <coughs> across the image, the b image brightness, basically, at each x, x y point. And so <coughs> the Fourier shift theorem says that, um, that a, a, a spatial shift in the image is caused by uh, a, a phase shift. And so here's our inverse Fourier transform. So we're summing across all of k-space, all, all spatial frequencies. And uh, so here's that phase shift. So minus i 2 pi k, kx, multiplied by x0. So this guy's, remember, this guy's a constant, not a variable. So that's a constant. So that's our phase shift. And we're multiplying that by our regular inverse Fourier transform. So here's, here's the, the k-space sig complex valued k-space signal at uh, spatial frequency, which we're summing across. And then we have our normal inverse Fourier transform, which is the same as the forward Fourier transform, except that we multiply by uh, e to the plus i, uh, 2 pi, uh, k, x, x, and that that x is is a variable. So this guy is uh, you know variable, uh, and then we're summing. Uh, you know we're summing across for every uh, 
spatial frequency. Okay, so that's our uh, that's our uh, Fourier shift theorem, and so what is it in words? So we just put it here. So Fourier, you know, shift phase shift theorem. So the Fourier shift theorem is it's basically phase shift. in spatial frequency. That would be this guy. Phase shift in spatial frequency domain causes uh, spatial, causes uh, image shift. So that's, that's, that's in words. So, I mean, it's kind of a, it's really sort of a trivial thing. If you look at it, um, so w what we're doing here is we're just multiplying by this complex number. Remember, this is a, a complex number of amplitude one, which, which has this angle, and that's an angle. And so we're just adding that angle onto this angle, because cause this thing is another angle over here. Uh, this guy, sorry, that guy right there is another angle. Um, and we could essentially just incorporate that thing, th this, this angle, into this angle, because it w when we multiply uh, two exponentials, that's equivalent to adding their exponents. And so if we just added, added this thing into this exponent, you know, what are we going to get? We're basically just going to get... Uh, so if we just sort of combine these two, we'll get, uh, and we'll essentially get, you know, uh, e to the i 2 pi kx, and then just combine them. So that was just x minus x zero. So basically we just combine those two. Uh, you know, the <coughs> we, we stuck the negative there in, into the, moved it into the x. That's where the negative came from. So, so you can see right here, you know, you, there's, there's the spatial offset. So it's almost, it's kind of like just a, a trivial outcome because you just have, you know, our spatial frequency k-space data multiplied by our normal, uh, inverse Fourier transform term, except we've got a, 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 a spatial shift here, and that just turns into this spatial shift here. So when you write it up this way with a separate term for the phase shift, then you can sort of like focus on the, you know, w what is this doing to the k-space data? It's actually, you know, what is that minus x doing to the k-space data? It's basically just messing with the phase of the k-space data of every frequency. So that's an important point here is that uh, this is, it's modifying every frequency, you know, so angle, so this guy, you know, modify, you know, every freak. Okay, so that's, so what, you know, what is this um, just visually, spatially, so if we just draw one frequency, so this is, this is image, this is not k-space, so, in, you know, image domain. Um, and we've got, so let's, you know, draw a brain in there. So here's a brain in there. And so what a, say we're doing, you know, spatial frequency two. Well, we have attempted to stamp on sort of two spin phase stripes like this. So that, that's our, you know, if, if we plot the spin phase, it looks something like this. So this is like zero and two pi. So the idea is we attempted to stamp on two cycles of spin phase. Um, and so this is for, you know, for example, 
kx equals 2. Okay, so two, two cycles of spin phase. And now we're going to modify that by multiplying every spatial frequency by, uh, by this complex exponential, which is just adding an angle to it. So we're just going to add an angle to the spin phase at each point. And so, so here's our, you know, add phase error, error angle, okay? So we add a phase error angle, and what does that do to our spin stripes? So what it does is it will, if we draw out the graph first, say we were supposed to be at at zero at, at the left side, but if there was a phase error, say it moved us up, wrapped us all the way around a little bit, and so you end up with something that looks like this. And then it doesn't get quite quite up to the, you know, back up to two pi. So all it did was, it. you can see what it did, is it, it just, it just basically took this spin phase stripe pattern and just shifted it. And so now the, the, the wraps are going to occur here. So here will be the, you know, the lowest phase. And then, it, so it will have just shifted these, these stripes over, just physically shifted them over. And so when you look at it that way, well, it's just pretty straightforward that, you know, it's going to cause a, a spatial shift in our image. So the important point about this is, so this is, this is not a gradient, okay? It's, I call it like a pedestal, pedestal of spin phase. Because we're adding, um, uh, we're adding phase to everybody, but equi equivalent amount of phase to everybody across the whole image. And so that's important thing. So don't, don't get confused and think of this as a gradient. It's not a gradient. We just sort of like added a, a pedestal of phase to everybody. And it also added it to every frequency. And so that's, that's a little sort of slightly weird because that means higher frequencies, say like 20 stripes. Let's just draw one of those out. So, so say we had, well, not do 20. How about like, you know, about however many I end up with. So say we put on this many stripes, like that. So what is it going to do to those? It's not going to move them as much, right? So it's just going to move them in proportion to the um, size of the stripe. So this guy is only going to be moved something like, uh, if we move this one, say, about a quarter of a stripe. So this was, you know, like, you know, this was like about uh, 90 degree phase, you know, plus 90 degree phase. So we're only going to move this guy, you know, a small amount. All right, that guy's just going to be a little bit off like that. So this is, you know, how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this was, this was, you know, K, x equals 9. This guy was, you know, kx equals 2. So the higher frequencies, they're, they're, they're not going to be moved as much, but it all works out in the end. And if you, if you work it through, what will happen is it will just, it will completely shift the image without blurring it at all, just shift it in space. So that's the Fourier, Fourier phase shift uh, theorem. And... Um, like I said, we <coughs> remember back in the back in the day we talked about like a cosine brain. Remember, uh, and we had we said if we you know change the phase of the of the k-space data, like if we went from you know the phase was supposed to be like like uh, zero, but we we messed with it in this special sort of Hermitian way. Uh, then uh, what did that do? That actually just shifted our image when we on Fourier transform. The same thing. So that's the Fourier phase shift theorem, which is you add some phase onto the k-space data 
So this guy is, you know, case-based data. So anything that adds phase onto the case-based data or subtracts it is going to essentially just get turned into a spatial shift. So the gradients could be nonlinear. That will cause a, a, a spatial shift in the image. Or you estimated the center frequency wrong. That will cause a spatial shift in the, in, in the image because it's going to affect the phase of all the spins. Okay, so is this is this one clear? So that's Fourier Fourier phase shift theorem. So alternatively, we could mess with the frequency. And so this one is this one's stranger. This one's kind of a little strange because like phase, you know, you usually think about phase and then how does that get get turned into like a uh, you know, a completely rigid translation of, of the image. Uh, but the Fourier frequency shift theorem is what if we, what if we somehow um, messed up the, the frequency here, the frequency of our, of our case-based data. So what does that turn into? And so it turns out that turns into a phase shift in the image. So here's the phase shift in the image. I two pi, and then we've got subscript and the subscript. So this is this is k x, and then a subscript on the subscript k x zero. So that's a constant frequency shift. So this is kind of like this constant. So this is a constant. frequency you know shift so that that thing is a constant this this whole term is a constant and it's going to essentially shift the phase of the image now remember the phase of the image is supposed to be zero because we're supposed to have a real brain and so it should it shouldn't have any imaginary part but um, now we're going to create an imaginary part in our image and so if we write out our inverse Fourier transform, it's the same equation there. So, so here's our case-based data, complex case-based data. Uh, but now it's going to have a frequency shift in it. So here's that subscript on a subscript. So, so this guy is, you know, constant, you know, constant frequency shift. And we'll say like how, how you could possibly get that. And this guy's a variable. That's the variable that we're integrating over. And and then it's just the regular inverse Fourier transform. So it's e to the i two pi kx, that's a variable, times x. And summed across all spatial frequencies. So this guy, this guy is the uh, Fourier frequency frequency shift theorem. And so, in words, again, what you know, what is it? It's it's a frequency shift in spatial frequency. Uh, domain, a uh, spatial frequency domain causes phase shift in image. And what is that? <laughs> so that's, that's kind of, this is, this is a little weirder. So, so what's, what's going on here? So, um, and how could this occur? So this one we said, you know, how could this one occur? You know, the, the 
phase shift in spatial frequency domain, how could that, that one occur? That could occur like maybe we misestimated the center frequency. So that, that one, you know, like, or maybe our shim was off. Or maybe there was a gradient nonlinearity. Or maybe there was a B0 problem somewhere in the image. So many, many things could have essentially messed up the phase of our case-based data. But now we're talking about something else. We're talking about what if we somehow got the frequency of our, uh, our case-based data wrong? And so how could we possibly do that? Well, and the, the, a simple example would be what if we, you know, normally we try to make the echo happen right in the middle of case space like this, so that the echo is like, if I drew one of the echoes out, it looks like that, so that we go through, uh, we have timed the echo so that when we collect all our data points in case space, so here we're collecting all our data points, when we get to the center, that's actually the center of the echo. So that's, that's all, that's the way we want to do it. But say we did something else, say, uh, we somehow screwed up, but the timing was incorrect of our, of our um, data point collection. So say we just accidentally got behind and we didn't start collecting data until too late, and the echo ended up over here. So th this is when actually the, you know, w when all the spins came back into phase, the center of k-space, but say we didn't call it the center of k space. We just got screwed up, but there was some timing in the gradients or something like that. And so the echo occurred like, you know, halfway through. And so we wanted that to occur at spatial frequency zero, but instead the echo occurred at spatial frequency 30 or something like that. And so what would we call that? We would call that like an echo centering error. Now, that seems like, you know, that's like a, a major infraction. Like you'd, the echo was supposed to be in the middle and you put it like, you know, way out here. Wouldn't that screw things up? And the surprising answer is that you would not see the effect of this in, in the amplitude image, uh, according to this theorem here. Because what this theorem says is, if we have an offset in our frequency in k space uh, again this is like our phase our, our frequency error frequency shift so we thought it was you know we thought it was spatial frequency zero but in reality it was spatial frequency minus 30 that's what this that's what this offset here this constant offset means what is it going to do it's going to basically just not mess up our image at all, except it's going to change the phase of the image. And so what is, you know, what does that, you know, what does that look like? So, uh, so if we take this, you know, take this data, this shifted data, and inverse Fourier transform it, we're going to get a complex number. So, you know, at each point, each single data point is going to look something like, like a complex number like that, and then it will have a real part and an imaginary part, and there's the phase angle, and there's the amplitude. When we actually look at that image, what's going to happen? Well, after we, you know, inverse FFT it, we look at the image, and the image is just fine, no problem. It just looks like a brain image. So that's the amplitude image. And so it's not gonna, it's not gonna mess with that at all. It's gonna be the same, uh, same values, but the phase of it is gonna be wrong. And so what does that mean? Well, normally we throw that out. So when you, you know, this is, <coughs> this is what appears on the console. This is, you know, this is the console image. You just see the, uh, the amplitude image. And the amplitude image wasn't changed. Uh, all you did was you just messed with the phase angle. 
And so what does the phase angle look like? Well, what is the phase, phase angle supposed to be? It's supposed to be about zero. So if you look at a, if you just make an image out of the, the phase, so what should it be? It should be like a sort of a brain shape with all zero in it. <laughs> and then there'll be just noise out here because there's, there'll be sort of random phases out here because the signal is so tiny. So you'll see just a bunch of speckle out here of random phases, you know. This is kind of random phase uh, uh, in noise in air because those, th those signals are tiny. And then this should all be basically zero. But what will it actually look like uh, if we were off by, you know, say, <coughs> say we were off by four <laughs> so that I can draw it. So what will happen is there'll be, there'll be four stripes of image phase. And so what you'll see is, you know, there'll, there'll be like a, like a zero image phase there, and then it will go up, and then it'll go up and more, and then there'll be like a zero image phase here, and then it'll, it'll, so there'll be these little jagged stripes and image phase in the image. And if you look at if you look at the cover of Buxton's book, he's got a picture of one of these on there. You can see what it looks like. So this is, this is the, the, actual, the actual phase, the image phase. So remember, this, is, this guy here is all image. So this is you know, K-space on this side. And then we're doing a, an inverse Fourier transform, and this is you know, image. So uh, and this is an image up here. Yeah. So surprisingly, uh, it doesn't do anything. It just uh, it just screws up the image, the image phase. Um, and you know when you're first thinking about echoes, like you know, so if you if you looked at K space that was shifted like this, you would have a giant bright spot, which is the real zero spatial frequency, and it was not in the center of k-space. No problem. <laughs> so that's a uh, yeah, sort of strange, strange Fourier land. So these are, you can see they're closely related to each other. This one is a, a shift, a shift in phase that we messed up the, the, the spatial frequency by shifting the phase. That's actually damaging. That causes a big spatial movement, a spatial movement in the image here. Uh, that, that's that's a big effect. It could move the image halfway across the f the field of view. This one, uh, by contrast, uh, we we somehow screwed up where we thought spatial frequency zero was. Hardly does anything. It just it just adds some image phase over here. But the image phase typically we're throwing out. You don't even you don't even see that phase angle. Okay, so how's it going for the Fourier shift theorem, Fourier phase shift theorem, and Fourier frequency shift theorem is sort of, sort of clear. It's kind of, we've, we've just kind of gone over it and from all different angles. This is just the way that it's normally written out. Uh, uh, sort of written out. Okay. Questions about that? So phase shift causes a spatial shift. A frequency shift just causes a phase shift in the image, which is kind of less familiar because the, the image phase should be zero if everything was correct. Because it's, it's a real image. Yeah? Oh, the face. Yeah, so you can use this. So, yeah, so what would you use this phase shift image for? A typical thing you would use this for is you could use it to try to estimate what the B0 defect was. That, that's an example of how you might want to use a phase shift image. So there's several things you could do with that. Normally, we just throw it out because you just mainly want to see the amplitude image of the brain. But you can use the it, you, you can tell the scanner to save it, and then you could actually use that to uh, to estimate what the B zero defect is, especially especially if you have two echoes, because you can 
sort of uh, the, if you have a second echo after there's been more phase, more time for the phase shift to occur, you can sort of, you, you need two echoes in order to estimate that phase shift. So you, you, you would, you know, collect two phase images with two different echo times and then try to figure out the B0 defect. So you can use this, this information is helpful because it's indicating, uh, it's indicating essentially where, you know, where the, the phase shift, uh, where the B0 defect is messing with the phase. Uh, but um, if you're just looking at the amplitude image, uh, then you, know, you wouldn't see it. Yeah, I mean, the, the part that's kind of counterintuitive is you think of an image like an image just has one number at each point. But when we do the, the inverse Fourier transform, you're getting this image you're getting back is complex. It should be complex with the imaginary part equals zero, but it never is. And it really never is in this case. And in fact, it's possible there's, you, you can do something, there's a, there's a pulse sequence called asymmetric spin echo. A symmetric spin echo. So what you could do is you could collect an image and you know get a gradient echo in the middle of the image and then set the timing of your of your 180 pulse to get a spin echo over here. So you could you could get a you could get like a spin echo over here and a gradient echo over here that's not lined up with it. And when you look at that, you say like, wow, that's just, that's just wrong. <laughs> how, could you, how could you get sort of an image out of that? Uh, but because of this, this second theorem, that, that it's going to cause some, some, some phase, uh, phase error problems, but this, this, will, this will work fine, like with an offset you know, a spin echo that's actually offset from the center of K-space. There's several reasons why you might want to do this if you want to. Last time we talked about um, how uh, you might do spin echo to slightly weight your image toward smaller capillaries. This is one way of doing that. You could sort of do a gradient echo EPI and then arrange the spin echo to come a little bit off center so that you get sort of you don't completely kill your signal, but you know, because you got some gradient signal, gradient echo signal left there. But uh, you maybe weight your signal a little bit more toward smaller, smaller blood vessels. If you just look at this, it just seems wrong. Like you know, how how, how could I sort of make the, the gradient echo occur over here and the spin echo occur over here? Occur over here? It, it seems like it would mess things up, but it doesn't. It just messes up the image phase. Okay, so now, so that was uh, Fourier frequency, sh Fourier phase shift theorem and Fourier frequency shift theorem. Um, so now let's just talk about what you actually deal with every day if you're doing any kind of functional MRI, which is distortions caused by B0 defects. And so, so how does this work? So at first you would think, and I did too, that it must be like the Fourier shift theorem. Because if you mess with the phase, it's going to cause a spatial shift in the image. It's sort of natural enough. And well, it turns out it's not, it's, it's not what it is. Uh, it's really, it's really an example of the Fourier frequency shift theorem, this strange one that I'm erasing right now. So, so how does that work? So I'll, I'll first go over like how you might think it would work, uh, and then I'll go over how it actually works. So, how you might think it would work. So what are we talking about? We're talking about B0 problems. And you know, where do those typically occur? You know, if here's the brain, there's, 
I mentioned this in the in the ADM lecture. You've got a you got your ear canal, which goes underneath, right underneath the brain. There's air. The ear canal is quite long, and the there's this air that goes right under the brain. And when you have air right next to magnetizable stuff, your brain is magnetizable, the air isn't, that can cause a little local disturbance in the B0 field. And so what happens is, you know, all around, all around this little region there, there'll be some distortion. And another possible problem is the air in your uh, in your olfactory system. So there's something called the olfactory bulb. That's what the where your olfactory epithelium attaches to. And there's a very thin little plate of bone called the cribriform plate right here. It's got some holes in it. So, you know, normally the bone is nice and thick, but it thins down right there in order to allow the olfactory bulb to get connections from the olfactory epithelium. So this is right where the olfactory epithelium is. It's got to send axons through into the olfactory bulb. And so you've got some air that's right next to the brain. And so what's going to happen is there'll be kind of a big uh, defect right, right in this region of the brain. So this is, there's some air, like I mentioned last time, there's some air in the sinuses in the back of your skull, and that can cause like uh, a B0 problem uh, there, several different places with these things. So these are B0 defect. And that's going to cause the image to get messed up. And I, <laughs> uh, last year during all the COVID madness, um, your your eye is about is right about here. Right here's your eye, and, um, and then your nose, sort of coming down here, and some. Uh, you know, back in the day when they were forcing people to get all these nasopharyngeal samples, what 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 would they do? Here's your nostril. They're supposed to be aiming for the top of your throat. I apologize if anybody ended up having to get one of these uh, throat. And so what, what they were trying to do, what they were supposed to be trained to do was, here's your ear here. They're, they're supposed to stick the swab in and swab the back of your throat. But I've seen pictures on the internet of somebody sticking the swab in like this. And there were cases of somebody who actually, they actually severed the olfactory nerve and punctured the cribriform plate, causing the cerebrospinal fluid to come out. Because, so <clears throat> if you ever get one of these, tell them, aim toward the ear, <laughs> do not go up. <laughs> do not stick that swab up. <laughs> this is where the throat is, it's not up there. Uh, so, so that's, that's, that's the air, so now you'll remember it. <laughs> that's the air right there uh, that causes the B0 defect. That's a really big one, uh, big B0 defect. And so how did I think it worked? So, so here's what I, this is, I wrote my notes up years ago in, in the wrong way, and then I was, I finally tried to do some MATLAB, and I said, huh, I guess that wasn't the right answer. <laughs> So let's sort of imagine we've got a brain in here, that, and let's say that we stamp on, we turn KY up to four. So, so here's, here's KY up, up to four. So we put four stripes on the brain. So like here's the bottom, say here's the bottom of the stripe and then it's going up, and so you know, if you look at the phase, we're, we're slowly going like this. So we're, we're trying to do that. Four stripes on the brain. Now imagine you have a B0 defect, you know, plus, so this is our, uh, 
This is you now our original, no defect. And here's our um, local B0 defect. And so say there's a, like a local B0 defect somewhere in this range. And so what does that look like? That looks like uh, no defect here, and then maybe the maybe the, the magnetic field is just just overly big right there. So a, li a little defect like that. A little increase in the magnetic field. So what is that going to do? Well, it's going to mess up the stripes, right? So... So what does that do? So this is, you know, original no defect. Here's local defect. And this is our uh, data point with defect. So it's going to mess up the phase of the, of the, of the stripes. And so what is that going to do? If it was a positive one, it's going to squish the stripe. You know, so if you look at this here, what's going to happen? Well, there's going to be uh, this this stripe. We were uh, attempting to put it on, you know, across the brain like that. So we were attempting to put on a stripe like that. But when we got to the point where the defect was, there's going to be extra B0. So this is, you know, uh, plus B0. And so what that's going to do is it's going to bend the stripe down like that because the phase will be advanced there, and so we'll get to 360 more quickly. And then these stripes will be okay. So there's no question. It's going to bend the stripe. It will bend all the stripes. So it will bend uh, the, the higher spatial frequency stripes. They won't move as much uh, because they're higher, higher spatial frequency, but it's going to distort all the stripes. And then... So this is a garden path. This is, isn't, isn't the actual explanation. I'm going to just put it here just so you can make sure that you don't think it works this way like I did. <laughs> so now we uh, recon with undistorted stripes. That's, you know, Ft minus 1. So we, you know, reconstruct with undistorted stripes. And what... What would this do? Well, it seems like it should uh, start its stripes. Um, that's, you know, Ft minus 1. It seems like it should cause a shift, right? So, so what, um, you know, what does it do? Well, in fact, this is... Um, an example of the Fourier frequency shift theorem. Because what have we done? We've shifted the spatial frequency here. That's a higher spatial frequency than it should have been. So, so in fact, this is there's an example of Fourier frequency shift. And what does that do? Uh, no effect on the image. So no effect on amplitude image. You know, because, you know, same shift, um, you know, same shift for all frequencies. That's what the, what the Fourier frequency shift theorem is. So because same freak shift all freaks it's kind of like an echo centering error basically so you know we would this was supposed to be frequency four but it was you know we actually got five and then we put on five we'd actually get six because it, it squished it this way so this was you know you know this is you know k y equals four but over here it's uh, you know Ky equals five, <laughs> so amazingly it doesn't do anything. So all you'd see is you'd see a phase shift in the image, 
but it wouldn't spatially, sh that, the, the important point here is it wouldn't spatially shift the image. And we know that these, these um, you know, B0 defects cause a spatial shift, uh, in a spatial distortion in the image. So um, I actually discovered this when I was preparing my, my homework. And I said, oh, this should, you know, <coughs> I, I, I did, did the Fourier transform. I shifted, uh, I shifted the, I, I put this, this phaser in there and I did the reconstruction. I said, nothing happened. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so that's not the reason. So, so what is the actual reason for this spatial shift caused by a local B0 defect uh, in, in something like an echoplanar image? So, so how does the, you know, how does the uh, echoplanar data collection work? So we start in the center of K-space, we do an RF pulse that puts this into the center of K-space, and then we go down to the corner of K-space, and then we start recording data across K-space back and forth like that. And uh, what is the, the end result? Well, the end result is that uh, we're recording data, recording data over a long time. And so what's going to happen is we're going to have some phase shift that's bigger up here at the top of K-space than it is at the bottom of K-space. So, and why is that? Well, because it, it takes a long time to record this data, and so during that whole time, this little defect is doing its work, and it's, uh, it's, it's slowly advancing the phase more and more and more for that particular point in space. And so when we get up to the top of K-space, the effect will have had the longest time to advance the phases. So there's our little defect. So, so the phase error is going to be worse here. So phase error worst here. So what will that do? So, so the way to think about this is if we go back to that um, lecture where we talked about what if we sample k space to different amounts so we said if we you know sample k space uh like one two three four this way in in y and this way in x five and then we you know inverse fourier transform that say we get like square voxels of that size Okay, so that's our, that's our FT minus 1. So that's our starting, starting condition. But what have we done here? So what we've done here is we've got a, this phase advance, which is sort of increasing the spatial frequency by sort of making the stripes closer to each other. And so, so what, are we, what are we actually doing? Well, we're we're effectively stretching k-space because we're, we're getting up to a higher spatial frequency. So by the time we get up to the top of k-space, because of this defect, for, this, for, for that local part of the brain, the spatial frequency will be higher than it should be. We, we were trying to get up to, say, 128, and we'll get up to, like, you know, 130 or 100, 140 or something like that. And so... In our original discussion, if we, you know, sampled the same uh, rate here, but but spread out our samples here, uh, what happens? Uh, well, uh, when we do our inverse Fourier transform, if we go out to a higher spatial frequency, it's going to have our field of view and make smaller pixels. So, so what happens is we end up with you know, the same pixels this way, but the pixels get smaller this way. They get half as big that way if we've doubled our, 
spatial frequency. So, so, so what's actually happening? It's squashing the pixels because we're actually sampling out to a higher spatial frequency. We were mistakenly sampling to a higher spatial frequency uh, because this effect has been allowed to play out over time. Now, the, the important point here is that what is, what's fundamentally causing this is the fact that we're playing out this phase error over time. So if we just had a plain old phase error that was the same for all time, then it would cause a spatial shift because that would be the Fourier uh, phase shift theorem. So if we just added some phase incorrectly to all of k-space, that would just, that would cause the image to shift. But what we're doing here, uh, what we're doing here is different. What we're doing is we're, we're adding a phase error, uh, but it's building up over time with the effect that we're effectively recording uh, we're effectively stretching the k-space and recording to higher spatial frequencies. And the effect of that is to shrink the voxels. And so what it's going to do, it's going to do if, if, if here was your, your brain the way it was supposed to be, and you, know, you're, you were supposed to have these you know, voxels like that that were nice and nice and straight, what's going to happen is it's going to squash the voxels uh, just in the part of the brain where we accidentally recorded spatial frequencies that were too high. And so what it's going to do is it will sort of like squash them like that and make them smaller. And then these guys will be all okay. So, so basically, that's what's causing the that's what's causing the shift. So the so the shift is coming from is coming from this increase in the spatial frequency that were that that it was caused by this extra uh, b zero, but it also requires that the effect is being played out over time. Because if the effect wasn't played over, over time, what you would do is you just shift, you just shift the whole image. You wouldn't squash it. And so, so my original understanding was incorrect because I said, well, we've got, here's the stripes we're trying to put on. We've got something that's messing up the stripes. It's squashing the stripes, but it's squashing all the stripes. And so when it squashes all the stripes, it's a, Fourier frequency shift problem. All it does is mess up the image phase. It doesn't cause a spatial shift. So, you know, what is the spatial shift caused from? Well, it's caused from three things coming together. So you have a static B0 defect. And then we have a successive increases in phase error, error across k space, and what that does is essentially uh, higher spatial frequencies. in defect area and then that leads to smaller voxels squish now it doesn't have to be squished it depends you know on the sign of the error so if the error uh, <coughs> you know if the error was negative like that it would do the opposite it would sort of like lower the spatial frequency and if you if you lowered the spatial frequency, then wh what would you do? You would, you would stretch. So instead of, you know, in, in, instead of, you'd actually stretch the voxels out like that. And so, so you can, 
So depending on whether it's a positive or a negative defect, it's going to squish or, you know, so the, here's, here's squish, but we could also stretch. And then we could also reverse it if we went the opposite way through k-space. You know, so, so you could do the opposite. You, you could start, you know, start at the, at the center of k-space, go up to the top, and then go this way. You can make the scanner do this instead, in which case the, you know, the error would build up. The error would be worse down here. And so if you did that, then it would turn a stretch into a squish. Uh, a squish. So, so if something got squished and you really want to record it, you would probably want to reverse the order that you went through k-space and stretch it out instead of like squashing it all down into a, a little um, unrecoverable mass of pixels on top of each other. <laughs> so so that's, the, that's the obscure reason that you get a, a, a B0 defect. It's not really from the Fourier phase shift theorem uh, because... Uh, if you, if you sort of mess with all the frequencies in the same way, that's actually a, an example of the Fourier frequency shift theorem. Uh, and wh what it is instead, it's a combination of these things. So you have like a, like a, a static uh, B0 defect. You've got successive increases in phase error, which means you're going up to higher spatial frequencies, which squishes your, vox <coughs> squishes your voxels. So that's the actual sort of reason for it. Now, you might wonder, you know, why does it only occur just in the phase encode direction? And that has to do with the fact that when you're going across k-space this way, this is a huge gradient. That's a huge gradient. And so the phase errors caused by these local defects are relatively small compared to that huge gradient. But this thing is a tiny, this is a blip is a tiny gradient. And so the, the phase errors are larger relative to those, to those tiny, tiny blips. And so the end result is that you only see this effect in the phase encode direction. And it's not because it's the phase encode direction, because the frequency encode direction is also a phase encode direction. It's just because the gradients are bigger. So the gradients are bigger in the, in the frequency encode direction, and so you just don't see that. If it's still occurring. It's just like a small fraction of a voxel, so you can't really see it. Whereas these little small blips, the B0 defect is bigger relative to them, and so you see all this effect happening in the phase encode direction, but it's not because it's phase encode. It's just because the blips are small. So this is quite, this is kind of obscure, but it's something you deal with every day. Whenever you do an image, you're going to get a distortion spatial distortions in the phase encode direction only, pretty much, that are mainly due to, uh, due to these um, uh, buildup of error across k-space, uh, resulting in essentially messing with the maximum spatial frequency that you went up to, also known as messing with your voxel size. And so that's actually what, what, what's causing this this defect. And there's, uh, just for the last negative one minute, there is another kind of defect that can occur with, that sort of looks a little bit like this, but it should be distinguished. And that's, that's what we would call a dropout. So that's not the same, it's not quite the same thing. So, so what happens with a, with a dropout? So one thing that can happen is if we're Turning on the turn on a gradient with the the goal to select a horizontal slice. So we turn on the gradient, and then we're hoping to select a horizontal slice like that. And how do we select that slice? So this is you know uh, gradient you know plus narrow band of RF. So if we, if we put a narrow band of RF, uh, that should, should just select the guys that were resonating at this particular point in the gradient. So that's our standard slice select. 
But what's going to happen like over here? Well, there's a B0 defect. And if there's a B0 defect, what that's going to do is move the resonant frequency at that point so far off that we won't stimulate with this particular narrow band of frequencies. So, so the, the, the idea is we have this you know, na narrow band of frequencies, and that narrow band of frequencies is just supposed to hit the part of the gradient. You know, it's just supposed to hit this part of the, you know, this part of the gradient, which will be the same you know, across, across the whole head. And so if we've got enough of a B0 defect that it shifts the resonant frequency enough so that the narrow band of RF doesn't hit it, well, you know, then we're, then we're hosed. And so that's, that's a different thing. That's an actual dropout. So we didn't even, so what does is, what is the dropout mean? It means dropout uh, didn't, you know, uh, excite spins in defect region. And so that, that can actually just cause like a little black hole in the image. It's generally in the same place as the distortions are. <laughs> so you can see like there's going to be like some squishing and then there might be like a black hole in there too. <laughs> so there's just certain parts of the brain that are, so you might, you might get like an, an actual sort of like empty black, that's supposed to be an empty black hole. So you, you could get both things, but that's a different it's a different phenomenon than this than the, the stretching business, and so obviously you you can't fix the dropout by sort of unstretching it because the signal's just gone. Okay, so that was kind of a long lecture. Any questions about uh, Fourier phase shift theorem, Fourier frequency shift theorem, or local B zero defect, which is this sort of combination of you know a defect plus successive increases in the phase error over time across, you know, case space, you know, over time. That's the critical part. And those two things together, you know, end up causing this squishing. Okay, any questions? No? Okay, sort of, sort of okay. It's uh, yeah. It, it it takes a couple of years to actually remember remember it all, but you know, there's always a first time. 